Uh, welcome everybody. This is Dr. Perry and uh, the topic for this presentation is going to be dosing and spacing. And uh, as most of you know, we've been in the process of creating a series of uh, little video clips to help our colleagues uh, better understand stress, distress, and trauma and share some of these concepts uh, in their communities. Uh, in an attempt to try to help a little bit in this current pandemic. And we've covered already these four topics and we're on to our second set of topics. And uh, today I'm going to talk about dosing and spacing. Basically, what uh, what's a meaningful dose of interaction that helps somebody become regulated? What's a meaningful dose of an interaction that helps somebody potentially um, make therapeutic change. And one of the things I, 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 I am going to talk about is really the dosing of stress. Uh, because as I, I, I discussed previously, one of the things that we know about stress is that it really is something that is not necessarily bad for you. In fact, stress is what helps you develop resilience. Stress, if it's present in the proper pattern and in the proper dose, it will literally make you healthier. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I've shown this before, and I think uh, those of you who've been following our work know this very well. Um, it is the pattern of stress that determines whether uh, in a set of experiences will build resilience and make you healthier, or whether the set of experiences will uh, sensitize your stress response system and wear out your end organs, including your heart, your lung, your gut, and systems in your brain. And then, and because of that, make you vulnerable. So the key really is kind of what is, what is, the, what is the right dose? And the answer is, it's complicated. Uh, and it's, but it's not as complicated as you might think. It's certainly, I want you to appreciate that it's not random. Uh, what and what the right dose of stress that can help build strength can be figured out if you know a little bit about the individual. And so one of the key things in, in the way we think about this is that if you look at a, this stress reactivity curve, which is, and, and give me a minute to just explain this for people who haven't been in on these previous webinars. What we know is that uh, we have this very complex array of neural networks and physiological systems in the other parts of our body that help us respond to stressors. And the stressors can be things ranging from hunger, thirst, cold, uh, to some external threat like chaos and, and, and interpersonal uh, conflict or extreme threat that's life-threatening. And, and we have this ability to sort of sense this, uh, these stressors and send that information into our brain. And then our brain basically helps us shut down systems that we don't need in the moment and then activate systems that will help us get through what's going on in the present. And so most of us have a neurotypical, what we call homeostat or set point. And so when we are uh, wake up in a safe and familiar environment and there's no novelty and there's no significant stressor or demand, we're able to activate our brain and stay in this active alert state. And if you, again, we use this upside down triangle model of the brain, and this is indicating that the top part of your brain, the cortex, the most human part of your brain, the part of the brain that's involved in thinking and communicating and reflection on the past and inventing new things, this really powerful, important part of your brain, you have access to when you're in the right state. And so, as I said before, you wake up in a safe and familiar environment, you uh, aren't particularly distressed and you've got access to your cortex. But then you get up and you get in your car or you go catch a bus and you get out into the world where there's hustle and bustle and there's a little bit of unpredictability and there's some demand on you 
to, to perform in a certain way. You've got to teach kids. You've got to, you know, go to work and interact with colleagues. And, and that's stressful, you know, and it, not, not traumatizing, but it's a stress. And then you, 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 but you, what you do is because you're neurotypically organized, you activate this, uh, these, the systems that you need to, but you can still use your cortex. So that the dose of novelty that you can handle is, is pretty reasonable. The dose of stress, it's, you know, you can handle it's pretty wide range of experience and still manage it with a, a pretty functional cortex. But if you're sensitized, if you have a stress response system that has been influenced by developmental trauma or something has happened that has resulted in unpredictable, extreme, or prolonged activation of the stress response system, you're going to be on this curve. And so when you are introduced to the tiniest little bit of challenge, the tiniest little bit of novelty, you're going to activate your stress response system really quickly. And so you start to literally deal with the tiniest little transitions, the tiniest little, little, little changes in your environment as if they're a significant stressor. And when it's a significant stressor, what happens is you'll activate your stress response system and you'll shut down significant parts of your cortex. And so, this, of course, leads to a different kind of behaving, a different kind of interpretation of the present, a different kind of uh, internal state of, you know, you feel more anxious, more dysregulated. And this is why children and adults who have a sensitized stress response from previous histories of trauma or other kinds of sensitizing experiences, like being marginalized in a society, that they will have challenges with what many people would consider moderate stressful experiences. Like they may have a harder time with transitions at school. They may have a harder time with uh, the introduction of a new kid in the classroom. Uh, they may have a harder time with a change at work. They may have a harder time with a pandemic that makes you uh, basically home uh, isolate. And so this this state dependent functioning is a major factor in determining what's a proper dose of novelty for you. So the dose of novelty, and again, let me just back up a second and, and remind everybody that the cortex, the brain is uh, basically has this process where it sequentially processes information. And as the information from the outside world, from the present moment comes into your brain, all the information is, is compared with previously stored memory. And if the present is completely novel, your brain's default response isn't to go, oh, hey, these new things are great. The brain's default response to new things is to be wary of it, to be partially defensive of it. So you kind of activate your stress response. Now, if you have a neurotypical stress response and you are a, a child and you go to school and the teacher introduces new content, that's a challenge. This little bit of novelty, literally education requires the sequential introduction of new content, the sequential introduction of novelty. And what that does is it takes the child and every day it gives them a doses of challenge. But because you're neurotypically organized, the teacher's dose of challenge is, is, is pretty wide. It, it's, you know, the, the teacher says, oh, you're 10 years old. I'm going to give you a 10 year old, something that I expect a 10 year old can manage. And if you're neurotypically organized, that's usually a good fit. But if you happen to be sensitized and the teacher expects you to manage this dose of novelty, this dose of new content, you're going to unravel this child and they'll literally get overwhelmed by what another person is not overwhelmed by. And so this is a really important point. The actual dose of novelty that a neurotypically organized kid can manage is much higher than the dose of a child who's got a sensitized stress response. Now, some of you may remember that one of the things that I talked about in a previous uh, 
presentation about uh, the stress response had to do with um, I, just, you know, again, let me go here for a second. And one of the things that happens that, that, that makes a, an experience moderate and controllable is that when you have the stressor and you activate your stress response, you have, and here's the event, here's the, here's the dose of stress, you have an opportunity to have adequate spacing to get back to your baseline before there's another challenge. And when that happens, you can create this pattern of predictable moderate activation that leads to tolerance. What happens when you experience a sensitizing pattern of stress is that you may have a, even a moderate stressor right here, here's the moderate stress, and you activate your stress response, but before you get back to your baseline, you have another stress, and it's unpredictable, and you don't control it, and so you activate your stress response again, and then there's another stressor, and so a chaotic, uncontrollable stress activation leads to a pattern of stress activation that basically changes your set point. And that's what happens, you know, that's what results in this, this curve. And so your baseline is higher because your brain keeps you in this low level or even sometimes a high level of alarm all the time. The, the dose of stress activation you can tolerate is pretty small. And you need more space in between the events to be able to get back to baseline. So let me look at this. Let's pretend this is a classroom and you have a, <clears throat> a neurotypically organized child and you have a child who's a little bit tuned up and the teacher introduces a, a challenge. Here's some novelty. Here's a new, new content. And because it's new, it's going to activate the stress response system of the neurotypically organized person, and it's going to activate the stress response of the sensitized person. But because the sensitized person has a bigger reaction and it takes longer to get back to baseline, the introduction of a second piece of novelty, which is given with adequate spacing for a neurotypically organized kid, is not adequate for this child. And so the very same curricular expectations in a classroom that leads to one child developing mastery and basically resilience around the topic area leads to sensitization for the other child. And this is a huge issue. This is gonna be a huge issue in our current situation because I can guarantee you, that, and I talked about this in the first webinar, little by little by little, everybody's baseline is gonna to start to creep up. Every one of us, I don't care how well organized or neurotypically organized you are, if you start out right here, and you're, you're, you, you may even be sort of a, a resilient person, but because you're, there are going to be more experiences of unpredictability and, and more experiences of stress and distress, there'll be fewer things you can control, and the magnitude of stressor is going to be more than moderate over the next couple of months for almost everybody. Your ability to demonstrate resilience is going to start to erode and then it's going to start to erode and then it's going to start to get to the point where you're instead of being the superhero clinician that you are or the superhero teacher that you are that can handle all this stuff and take care of other people you're going to start to be just like the rest of us and then if this goes on long enough we're all going to start to be on our last nerve and our ability to handle more novelty and more distress and more demands and more distancing and now you wear a mask and now you you, you know all of this stuff we're going to start to have significant vulnerability to what is going to be a dose of additional stress and so this is what i want you to just be aware of is that we're all going to start to have our reserve of resilience tapped out even by tiny little doses of challenge. Now, 
let's just flip this a little bit and, and talk about this in a little bit more optimistic way. I mean, because that's kind of a pessimistic perspective, even though it's realistic, I believe. Here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to appreciate. We've talked a lot about what is a dose of, how, how can we create doses of predictable, moderate, controllable stress to kind of keep adding to our resilience reserve? Because that's envision your resilience reserve like this cup. And we need to just keep adding in. Every time we have more little moderate controllable wins, right, that adds to this, this cup. And, and, and that's going to be counterbalanced by all of these sort of unpredictable experiences, things that we can't control. And so the important thing now for you to remain hopeful and to recognize the power of the moment these experiences that help either build our resilience pool or sort of, you know, help us provide regulating interactions for others don't have to be long. They literally can be seconds long. So every moment that you take, you know, if you can take two minutes and you control that you stand up and get away from your desk and take some deep breaths and do some stretching in those two minutes, that's building, that's adding something to your re resilience cup. And th th what you really need to appreciate is this, and, I, and I'm going to talk about this in context of what's a meaningful duration of time for a neural network. And I don't want you to kind of, I hope I don't lose too many people on this, but it, this should make sense. So here you are, let's pretend that you're sitting in, in this wonderful lecture and, and you're not threatened, you're not hungry, you're not thirsty, you're not cold, you're looking at the slides, you're going, oh, this is interesting, you're engaging your cortex. And even if you're externally focused for these 10, 15 seconds, the reality is after about five, six, eight, 10, 12 seconds, the human brain cannot stay fundamentally fully externally focused and you start to basically spend more time thinking about where does this fit in my working model of the world. So all of you who've been watching this presentation, you've been sort of engaging a little bit and then you're taking a little bit of what you're learning and seeing where does it fit? Have I heard this before? Does this make sense? Do I know a child that this has happened to? And so what you're doing is you're, you're having this internal and then external uh, process, a rhythmic process of cognitive processing. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is that this disengagement from being fully externally focused is part of the dissociative regulation I was talking about before. It's not bad. When you partially disengage from the external world, you're, you're in your inner world and you're kind of thinking about uh, other things. Like I said, you're trying to fit this new stuff into your working model. But then I show a new slide and you're gonna go, you're gonna go look at it. And, and, and you get pulled out for a little while and you pull information into active working memory. And then once it gets into active working memory, it goes to sh kind of this short-term reserve memory. And then you try to fit it in your long-term memory and you're going back and forth and doing this. Now the reason I'm talking about this right now is that that process gives us a clue about what the duration of a meaningful neurophysiologically meaningful dose is. And it's only seconds long. And so that's the good news. Your brain literally prefers information in these little seconds long bits. You don't have to regulate your kid for you know, an hour. You don't have to go for an hour long walk. You can basically create moderate, controllable, predictable doses of activation of your stress response by thinking about, even within a 10 minute window, controlling the way you move, the, how, how your deep breathing, these tiny little doses, these things are powerful. And I do believe if you begin to understand with intention what a therapeutic dose is, what a regulatory dose is, you're going to be much more willing to think about how do I, you know, it feels like the world's going crazy and there's all this stuff that's kind of bombarding on me, but you know what? I can control, you know, a 10 minute period of time where I, I don't watch the news. 
where I uh, intentionally focus on taking some deep breaths and then taking a tiny little walk and then, and then maybe intentionally making a phone call or sending a text to somebody I love, I can literally have by my computer a list of 10 people that I wanna make sure I connect with a couple times a day. And, and what I'm gonna do is every time, every 40 minutes, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a three, four minute walk, and then I'm gonna send a text or, or write a nice little note to two or three of these people on the list. That is literally a resilience building response to the, all of this stuff that's going on around you. And I want you to appreciate that. And, and it's all about your ability to kind of take advantage of that is about understanding and appreciating dosing and spacing. Now, the other thing I want you to appreciate is that when you're interacting with other people, as you feel them start to escalate, you need to appreciate that the dose of something that you provide for them, it's gonna be brief too. So like this isn't the time to introduce a new cognitive concept to a kid. You know, the dose of them being able to sort of learn a new concept, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna diminish as, as this event goes on and we all get more dysregulated. Um, and if you live with a child who's, you know, who's, was, is in foster care or who has trauma related sensitization, you need to recognize that they're gonna need a lot of spacing in between your efforts to try to put new things into their head and even in between your efforts to regulate them. And so appreciate, the, the, again, the more you appreciate the power of these patterns, uh, the, the duration of a meaningful dose, uh, you're going to be able to help yourself. And I think you're going to be able to, to help others. And again, you know, this is just a, an image of, you know, we have lots of kids that we've worked with who've had all kinds of unpredictability and chaos in their pattern of exposure to stress. And it leads to them being sensitized. But e you can capture these kids and begin to introduce controllable, predictable, moderate stress activation, and they can get to this neurotypical point, and then they can ultimately build resilience. All right, so... There's a lot more we could talk about. I've already gone 20 plus minutes. Um, there's a couple of things that, that will make uh, this whole process a lot easier. And one of the most uh, powerful elements about appreciating dosing is, is giving the person you're interacting with controllability of the dosing process. And the best way you do that is not being face to face and coming up to them and saying, hey, I, I wanna tell you about or I'm going to dose you now, or I'm going to regulate you now. It's being present. Be in the same space with them, but be parallel. And then be patient. And then give them the time and the control of how they use you and engage with you and, and use you to regulate. They're going to come in, they're going to engage, and then they're going to go back. They're going to come in, they're going to engage, and then go back. So you stay where you are and stay patient and let them come to you, particularly if it's a child who has any form of, of relational sensitivity, any kind of attachment problems. And if you do this, just you, you're gonna find the power of proximity. Just being present is one of the most important, powerful things you can do. Being present and being quiet. So, all right. Um, I'm gonna stop this didactic here, and, and those of you who wanna uh, learn more about what we're doing and, and have more access to, to this content. Um, as I've said before, we, we have uh, a lot of content that we are accumulating and posting on this link right here. And those of you who want more background on any of our content, you can get it right here.